We are very bad at explaining how something begins. We are very bad at explaining how life begins, how the universe begins. And Kubrick seems to suggest we just equally as bad at explaining how technology begins. And maybe it's less surprising if you think about it in this way. I mean, why, would, why should we have greater insight into how technology begins if we don't understand how life begins? You know, and there is a distinct possibility that life and technology are kind of linked, yes? Um, but then, it's kind of equally interesting to ask how a photograph begins, how an image begins. Where is the beginning of the image? Um, the image of the image? From the beginning of all the existence? <laughs> because no, the, the image as like in the photograph. <coughs> Where is the beginning of the, of the when, when is it? Uh, there is, this is an interesting question, we'll come back to it in a minute. Um, there, is a, um, there is a lovely uh, essay in the last issue of Philosophy of Photography. The library subscribes to that, it is online as an electronic copy. It's a journal, well, I will say that it's a good journal because I, I'm the editor. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but um, it's um, at the moment it has, um, in, in, in the current edition it has a really nice essay by uh, Emma Bennett and it, it's called uh, The Danger of the Saving Power of Thomas Demand and in this essay she basically reads Heidegger's essay that we read now Question of Certain Technology through the photographic work or the sculptural work of Thomas Demand. Do you know the work of Thomas Demand? Yeah, uh, anyone? Do you know people? You don't. Uh, is that Demand you know? Thomas Demand. Uh, D E M A N D. Yeah? Yes? Do you know? Yeah, good. Um, like Peter Sanders, I don't know what he does. Was it? Say it again. Um, no, you were asking if anybody knew it. Of, 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 of Thomas Demand. Yeah. Now, I just wanted to know if you're familiar with the work. Yeah? Uh, and if you don't, if you're not familiar, you should really get to know his work. Um, there are books in the library, and it's, it's one of these artists who is, uh, <laughs> online is very difficult to make it justice to his work. But Emma Bennett, in this essay, reads Heidegger's essay, concern, essay uh, question of science technology through the work of Thomas Demann. So um, I strongly recommend that you read this essay and look at the work of Thomas Demann. We're going to look at it today. I will um, use Emma Bennett's insight to, because I think she found a really nice way to show what Heidegger is about in this essay through the work of the document. So we try, we try to make, to make some time. The, the name of the article is uh, The Danger and the Saving Power of Thomas Demand. Emma Bennett. B-E-N-N-E-W-T. Yes. And to buy, you have it in the library. In order to buy it, you need to go to the website of the publishers, which is the Intellect, uh, Intellect Publishers, and you can subscribe. I don't know if you can, you can buy PDFs, I don't know if you can actually buy an individual hard copy. Uh, that was always a big uh, issue. Is yes. that the last issue? That's the last one, it just came a couple of uh, weeks ago. Um, so, uh, <coughs> but this essay, you should be able just to download from the library website because we are, we are subscribed yeah, and you just get the e copy. Um, okay, let's. So, how, well, what, what do you know about the work of Thomas Demand? Um, Eamon, 
What 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 is yeah? So this, well, this image, for instance, yeah, it's everything is made out of paper. Of course, the image itself is paper that now we see uh, on the screen. Um, but everything in the image is made out of paper. So Demand is a sculptor, um, and he sculpts in paper, and then he photographs what he sculpts and destroys the paper model. The interesting thing, well, there are many interesting things about about this one. But one of the points Emma Bennett makes in this essay is that only as a photograph these constructions look realistic. If you looked at the model itself, you of course will not think it's real. We will see it's a model, it sits on the table, yeah, it's on a, on a platform. And um, does he construct it in the, in the real scale or? No, 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 no. It's, a, it's, a little, it's a model. Um, there are some videos even on his own website about his studios and how it is made because it is a fascinating, incredibly meticulous process with hundreds of shapes cut precisely and alive. I mean, but it's, all, it, it's quite small. It's not definitely not like life size. So that's what I'm saying. It's not like you can walk into one of these models unless you're Alice in Wonderland. Um, and if you saw it on a day, you will not confuse it for a second. So yeah, does it make sense? Mm -hmm. But as a photograph, we very easily confuse it as a real thing. We look at it, and the first thing we think is, oh, that's a photocopy. Yeah. It's a photograph. Of, it looks like a documentary photograph of a photocopy. Yeah? But this is the moment of innocence in the encounter with demand. If you then read the description that says, a photograph of a paper model or something like that, the innocence is lost, never to be regained again, and instead you realize that you look at the constructed world. That's where the very interesting um, interplay between real and the copy and the recording and the photograph begins. And you sort of um, find yourself in this continuous loop. So that's what I want to, to try to um, to trace today. Um, but I think the Emma um, Bennett's essay um, is, uh, is very interesting and it does um, this unpacking of demand through Heidegger in a very, uh, in a very nice way. Um, okay, let's have a look back to the text at the, uh, at, um, the next page where Where we continue with this thought. So, how we were already read it. Heidegger said, look, the essence of technology is not technology. You need to look for it somewhere else. And later on, he comes to say, the most common way to think about the essence of technology is um, that technology is a means to an end, or technology is a human activity. So, Heidegger says, these are the two common ways by which we explain what is technology. What does it mean to say that it's a means to an end? It's a tool to we use to achieve certain goals. So this is a phone, I use it to make phone calls. This is a computer, I use it to process and store information. This is a projector, I use it to project images. This is a table, I use it to put my things. Yeah? That's how we normally explain technology, by its use. Yeah? This is a jar, it can hold a volume of liquid. This is a photograph, it is a picture of something or someone. That's how we normally explain technology. When people ask us to explain photography, we normally explain it as in terms of what it does. What is it for? Yeah? Or we explain it as human activity. We might say, um, well, you know, it's only humans who use tools, only humans who use technology. 
Um, so photography then becomes not only means by which pictures can be made, but it also is a kind of um, expression of our humanity. As human beings, we are endowed with the ability to make images, and that's what photography is for. But Heidegger says that these two definitions are problematic because, and that's where we go to the next uh, paragraph, uh, because uh, the current conception of technology, I mean, can someone read to us just this uh, short paragraph? Yes, then. The current conception of technology, according to which it is a means and a human activity, can therefore be called the instrumental and anthropological definition of technology. Okay, so it is instrumental because we describe technology as an instrument. <coughs> so we, if, if we say photography is a means to obtain accurate pictures, to, to obtain quick, cheap, accurate pictures, we describe it, this description is instrumental because we treat photography as an instrument, as a tool, as a means to an end. And another approach, um, the, the one that describes photography or any other technology as human activity is anthropological. What anthropological means? It? What generally anthropology means? About humans. About humans. Hawaii. Okay. How, what? what? Um, anthropos. Anthropos. Anthropos is man. Yes. And logos, logos is, is knowledge. knowledge. The knowledge of man. Or you could say human knowledge. Either knowledge of humans, or knowledge about humans, or that which humans know. Anthropology. In either case, what is at the center of the anthropology? No. The anthropos. The, the human. The human. Yeah? Don't forget that logos as the knowledge Whose knowledge? Stones have knowledge, fish have knowledge, orangutans have knowledge. It's human knowledge. So uh, the anthropological is also slightly tautological. Yeah? Because the logical is already it's it's belonging to the anthropos, to the human. Yeah? But anthropology, in the way Heidegger wants you to hear is a way of looking at the world that puts the human in the very center. That, that's anthropology. It puts the human in the center. Now, uh, for Heidegger, as you can guess, that is a problem. Because, he says, when we put ourselves in the center, we start to get a very skewed and one-sided picture of the world. Well, for instance, the church, the European church, the Christian church, put for a long time the earth in the center of the universe. Yeah? Which is a kind of, can you see that this is an anthropological model? The human, the earth, in the center of the universe. In this model, this the Christian um, model of the church, Everything revolves around the Earth. And as Copernicus later pointed out, things start, you know, the, the, it does not explain many things. It leaves many unanswered questions. It starts to cause problems. So, so it is with anthropological approach. It is skewed in favor of the anthropos, in favor of the human. And you get a kind of distorted picture of reality. Yeah? We might say that if we explain photography from the perspective of what it is doing to us, or how we use it, um, or um, what kind of uses we put it to, we already put ourselves in the very center. Yeah? But I think Heidegger can um, 
imagine that that will raise some objections. Because he says in the next sentence, who would ever deny that it is correct? It is in obvious conformity with what we are envisioning when we talk about technology. The instrumental definition of technology is indeed so uncannily correct that it even holds for modern technology, of which in other respects we maintain with some justification that it is, in contrast to the older handwork technology, something completely different and therefore new. So, I would be saying even modern technology can be explained in this way as means to an end and a tool and something that human, humans use. Uh, modern technology too is a means to an end. Okay. And this is quite nice. Uh, Everything depends on our manipulating technology in the proper manner as means. And can someone read the next two sentences? Can someone read? Yes. Yes. We will, as we said, get technology spiritually in hand. We will master it. The, the will to master, to master it become all the more urgent, the more technology, quite things to seek for human control. Good. What do you hear here? What do you hear Heidegger is saying? What does it mean to get technology? How do you get it? Who gets it? Who gets it? Who just gets it? Who just gets technology? The one who knows how to use it. Who is it? Who just gets it? You know, doesn't need to really learn about it, just gets it. Have you been around children and iPads, for instance? Have you noticed how that they just get it? You know, you leave them with a computer, and before you know it, they know how to use YouTube and how to get all the games. You know, and I saw even <coughs> children who don't speak a word of English, learning to use the English keyboard and the interface in a language that they don't understand and still get the results they need. Yeah? They just get it. They didn't need to read the manual. Yeah? That's, that is a sense of mastery. You can say that this baby or a, or a toddler with the, with the iPad really kind of masters it. Master it because it's not, it doesn't even involve detailed learning. It's, you just get it. And Heidegger said that this will to master technology in the same way that a child masters the, the, the computer or the phone, this will to master technology becomes more urgent the more technology threatens to slip from human control. Yeah? So, what does it mean to say that technology threatens to slip from human control? Is that also kind of a common thought? Would you say that for you, for us, it is something we live with? And, and Stephen Hawking keeps warning of that. Yeah. Artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence. Bacteria. Is, is, is it only about artificial intelligence? When, when do you notice technology slips from human control? Does it ever happen to you? Whenever it's, whenever it's sort of like a uh, term was used, black box, like to where you don't know exactly what's happening. There's like this bit of magic that you just kind of just lead to the inventor. Or the like, you know, you know how um, modern cars are so technologically advanced they can be hijacked from, distance, from a distance and you might be driving along and suddenly someone just took over the controls and all the car just decides to stop or to take charge of the wheel and that's yeah. the same with people's houses and the, the lock systems and the lighting and the stereos they're all being you know governed by like one remote control that somebody else can pack into well, yeah, um, but so, so how do you say, this is interesting, how 
the more our will to master technology and to see technology as something that is there to be conquered and just controlled and subjected to our use is greater, the greater is the, the greater is the danger that it will sleep or already sleeps out of our control. Okay. Um, does it make sense? Yeah. Um, right. We're going to skip forward a little bit because uh, there is something very interesting happening. Um, Perhaps we can look at page 10. So first, just to fill you in on the bits of this um, serial that we're missing, we'll just keep few episodes ahead. Uh, in the meantime, what happened to the story of technology? Um, we left Heidegger warning us that the more we feel that we master technology, the more it skips, sleeps off our grasp, yeah, and we lose control over it. Um, and then Heidegger said, well, therefore, the, the, this scientific definition of technology in terms of what it does and how we use it is insufficient, even though it is uncannily correct. There is another. The essence of technology is not in how we use it. It is in something else. It is in something that technology brings forth, he says. Brings forward. Uh, so technology brings something forward and that is itself not technological. It's like saying that a photograph brings something forward that is not photographic. Well, you already mentioned it. You just spoke about sharing, about narcissism, uh, about memories. So you have a way of kind of thinking what exactly uh, Heidegger has in mind when he says that the essence of technology is that it brings something forward. But what exactly, what is it that it brings forward? And what do you think? When you bring something forward, you take something hidden and expose it. So for instance, uh, I bring something forward when I take it out of my bag and put it on the table. Yeah? There is a gesture of disclosure in this bringing forward. So technology, Heidegger says, discloses something to us. So what is it? Uh, so we are now on page 10 and we're going to try to understand what it is bringing forth because I think it's quite interesting even though the paragraph is quite bumpy. So anyone wants to, uh, to write it? To read it? Not only. Not only. It, oh, sorry, yes. It is of utmost importance from here. It is of utmost importance that we think bringing forth in its full scope and at the same time in the sense in which the Greeks saw it. Not only the abstract manufacturing, not only the artistic and poetical bringing into apparent and concrete imaginary, is a bringing forth poiesis. Thesis also, the arising of something from out of itself, is a bringing forth poiesis. Okay. So, uh, so this bringing forth, this bringing forth, is what? Is two words, is two things. Which are they? Well, which are they? The bringing forth itself, the, the, this disclosure of technology. Technology, just to remind you, not to lose you uh, on this path. Don't get distracted by the broken bottles and the, you know, the, the, the coffee cups. Pay attention to the journey. Yeah? We discarded the idea that we will understand technology by looking at how we use it. That, having said, is not going to explain anything. Technology brings something forward. Which might say, mean that 
this photograph is not only a picture of a dog. It brings forward something else. Yes? And Heidegger says this something else is kind of dual. It has two elements to it. Which are they? Both start with P. Thesis. Thesis and poesis. Thesis. What is thesis? What word? Exactly. Physical. Yeah. So this disclosure, this opening up of something, is made of two strands, the poetic and the physical. These two strands are completely connected to each other, like, you know, the two sides of this sheet of paper. This is the physical, this is the physical, this is the poetic. Try to separate them, and you cannot. You cannot divide it into, if you will divide it into, you will still have two sides. Yeah? You cannot separate. If you want to let go of the physical, you will let go of the poetic as well. If you you cannot have the poetic without the physical. If you want to, you know, um, it's like it's like the, the, a dinner plate. You know, if you want to have your main course, you also need to eat your greens. It's kind of it's coming together. You cannot have the one without the other. You know, like, like, like when I was a child, they used to always to say, you cannot have cheese without bread. If you want to have some cheese, have a piece of bread. Don't have it on its own. It will be a sin. Uh, cheese has to come with bread. Yeah? The physical has to come with the poetic. If you just want to gorge on cheese, you know, you end up being some kind of crazy poet. Can you know? It's a good question. It's a very good question. Uh, that exactly. Uh, we will come back to that. Uh, maybe nothing wrong, but Heidegger says it's just impossible. It's impossible to have the one without the other. If you, the poetic is already the physical. There is bread in the cheese. Yeah, I mean, I didn't promise you that my examples will. You know, we <laughs> become completely immune to any uh, logical irregularities. <coughs> but it just to show you how this is a disclosure, what technology makes evident is precisely the connection between the poetic and the physical. In technology, we realize that the creative and the mechanical are the same thing. Why is it? Do you want to say something? No. Why is, this, why is this interesting? Because since Marx, at least, since Karl Marx, we are, there is a very important way of thinking that says there is the base, and the base is the labor and the work, and then there is the superstructure, which is the culture, or poetry, or theory. But you first need to build a base, and then you, need, you can go to the theater or play the flute. Yeah? Heidegger says, no. He says, it's all one thing. It's not two things that are separate. You don't go to an art school because you already have enough savings to make sure that you will have a comfortable life. You, know? you don't build a solid base and then go to the art, to the art school. You go to the art school, to the art school, and you just do it. You just follow it, and then you figure it out. Yeah? The two things, the material and the poetic, the physical and the creative, are completely connected. So when you, when the farmer plows the field, or where the, when the woodworker uh, or cabinet maker builds a table, this is a technical action and it's also a creative action. It's two things, it's both things. Yeah? yeah? Yes? If we look to the world of the technology, it comes from techna and so it needs mechanical, but it's some 
in this case, it, it seems to me something not related just to technology in terms of uh, okay, how we know to 